Good morning. My name is Kimberly McQuarrie, the Director of Programming and Co-Director of the Innovation Labs here at the Delhi Museum. And it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to this edition of our Coffee with a Curator series. Today, we are celebrating um, our gala year here. It's our 40th anniversary, um, celebrated this year in 2022. 40 years of um, hopefully bringing people a lot of joy and um, a lot of educational um, information through this institution. And we're gonna be joined to explore um, some of this history by Shana Buckles Harkness, who is our librarian and registrar at the Delhi Museum. She's gonna be providing us with a history of the museum from its start in Cleveland, through its move to St. Petersburg and the remarkable growth that we have undergone since. But before we get to the talk, I'd like you please join me in thanking the city of St. Petersburg for their continued sponsorship um, of these events. And of course, a big thank you to all of our members who make events like this and others possible. You can always visit our website at thedelhi.org for more information about our activities and programming, including these upcoming events for January 2022. So tomorrow, um, Megan Moyer, my colleague, will be hosting um, our film club series. It's the last in our series of boundary breaking women, and she's going to be holding a film club discussion on nine to five. So if you're feeling nostalgic and you haven't watched that in a while, um, go home, give it a watch, uh, and register for that film club discussion tomorrow. It'll be a lot of fun. And then next week, we'll be resuming, um, after a little holiday hiatus, our Poetry at the Delhi series. Um, on Saturday the 15th, I will be um, hosting a workshop through our Innovation Labs program on creativity. So if you need a little um, juice to get your creative thinking started in 2022, um, be sure to check that out and join me then. And then on Sunday, um, we are going to have two events on the 16th. We're going to have our Yoga at the Dali, which is our monthly yoga program. And then we'll also be holding a vaccination clinic um, for anybody to come in and be able to receive their vaccine. And then finally, something I'm sure everyone has been waiting for, and that is the grand opening of our new exhibit, Picasso and the Allure of the South. Um, and that'll be on January 29th, the opening to the public. And then of course, if you're a member, be sure to check out our website for our member preview days, because um, you'll be able to get in and take a sneak peek. And that'll be a lot of fun. And as usual, be sure to follow us on our social media, Facebook, Twitter, um, and Instagram. And if you have anything to share in terms of our happenings or Delhi-inspired conversations, remember, hashtag the Delhi. Now, today, it's my pleasure to introduce my amazing colleague, Shana Harkness. Shana serves as the museum's library, librarian and registrar. Not everyone knows we're lucky enough to have an on-site library. And um, as such, we also have our librarian. She holds a master's degree in library and information science from the University of South Florida and earned her bachelor's degree in French and history from Stetson University. Her duties include managing the library and the archives, creating online exhibitions, showcasing works in the library, conducting extensive research for upcoming exhibitions and collections research, and documenting object information into the Dali Museum's database management system. Today, she's going to be presenting Keeping St. Pete Surreal, the Delhi Museum's 40th anniversary, where she will share a behind the scenes glimpse of the history of this institution. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Shana. Thank you, Kim. Okay. Well, I'll give you a little um, disclaimer. This PowerPoint was originally over 200 slides. Uh, 40 years is a long time. Um, I have cut it back, so no worries. Um, but it was a difficult um, decision which ones to keep and which ones to cut. But it is a great honor to be able to present the museum's 40-year history. Um, I've only been here eight years, 
but um, I have access to all the archives, the photos, and it's been just a wonderful experience going through and scanning um, all the treasures we have in there to make this presentation. And I'll let you know, um, the presentation will begin with some backgrounds about the museum and the collection, and it will be organized thematically, and within those themes, they will be chronological. So it's not going to be a straight chronology. Just wanted to let everyone know that. And again, 40 years is a long time. I do see some volunteers here and other people from the museum. Not everyone is pictured in this PowerPoint. As much as I wanted to, we would be here for days if, if that were to happen. So here we go. The Dali Museum was founded with the works collected by A. Reynolds and Eleanor Morse, who first encountered Dali's work in an April 1939 Life magazine. They purchased their first painting in 1943, and from that point on, they began a lifelong passion for collecting Dali's work and also built a lifelong friendship with Salvador Dali and Gala Dali. Through the 1960s, the Morrises display, displayed their entire collection in their home. So this moves us to the Beechwood Museum. After 25 years of collecting and with their home too full for all of their Dolly artwork, the Morrises decided to found a museum in their new IMS company office building in Beechwood, Ohio. And here's Dolly at the grand opening in 1971. It opened amid great fanfare. Dolly created this sign. It is something that we do keep. It's a watercolor on paper. And this is the Masterwork Salon in the museum and the office building. So he took half his office building and turned it into the Dolly Museum. Two of my favorite photos. This is the museum's second anniversary in Ohio with Deputy Director, Chief Curator Emeritus Joan Croft, who started with the museum and the Morrises in 1972. So by the mid 1970s, the overwhelming number of visitors at the Beechwood Museum made the Morrises realize that their collection had once again outgrown its home. And I think a lot of us are familiar with this article, um, the January 18th Wall Street Journal article. The Morses began a nationwide search for a permanent home for their dollies, offering to donate the entire art collection to an established museum to preserve its historical integrity. St. Pete attorney James W. Martin read this article and rallied community leaders to approach the Morses with the offer to receive and care for the collection in Florida. The Morses did not want the collection broken up. This was the main stipulation. There were other museums who had agreed to take pieces of the collection, but the Morrises wanted it in its entirety in one place. So the Morrises came down to St. Pete. They visited St. Um, Jim Martin picked them up, showed them around, and the Morses accepted the offer, and then a marine warehouse situated on Bayoboro Harbor was remodeled to house the collection. So here's some of the construction of the buildings. More museum construction. We have uh, the sign Dolly Research Institute, so not only was it going to be a place to exhibit the works, but A. Reynolds and Eleanor Morse um, were going to continue their research on Dolly and write about Dolly, and we'll learn more about that later. And here they are in front of um, the museum, still mid-construction. So these are photos. They had to prepare the paintings, these large masterworks that you see upstairs. 
They were preparing to move the Discovery of America and the Hallucinogenic Toreador from the Cleveland Museum down to St. Pete. So here they are packing, making sure everything's intact, and they rolled up the canvas, the Discovery of America. There are a lot of pictures and I couldn't add them all. Here is the semi-truck. Cleveland to St. Petersburg, November 1980, five semi-trailer trucks pulled up, delivering the precious cargo. And I believe Joan had told me um, that she or someone was right, uh, driving a Volkswagen bug filled with items as well and drove down. So here's the inside of the truck. Just an incredible move. And here's the new home in St. Petersburg, Florida. The museum officially opened on March 7th, 1982. And even the St. Pete Times, this was their March 7th, 1982 edition welcoming the Dali Museum of which we have several copies and archives thanks to diligent volunteers who have kept up with our newspaper clippings. And the public grand opening was on March 10th, 1982. There was over 1,400 people in attendance. We had marching bands, hot air balloons, tents, um, I was only five then, so I, <laughs> I, was, I was there. But um, Kathy White, if you're out there, she was probably there in attendance. Um, Peter Tush came a little afterwards. And here's the opening press conference. We see Jim Martin next to Eleanor Morse. And here are all the guests in the main gallery at the grand opening. Just think what a momentous event this would have been in 1982. This entire collection comes down to your city. Here's another picture of the gallery. And one of my favorite items, um, the newsletters. This was the inaugural newsletter of the museum. And all these historical newsletters have been digitized by one of our former volunteers, Sigrid Lannan. And they are accessible on the website. So you can search them. They're fun reads. You can, um, if you're a longtime volunteer, you can search your name. Um, but here's the first issue talking about the museum opening. And within this newsletter, we see 30 docents graduate from the first docent class. Our committed docents have been sharing the legacy of Salvador Dali with the public since the museum's opening on March 7th, 1982. And they still do a wonderful job today. Here's an overview of the gallery. Some of you are very familiar with the old, as we call it, the old building. And then just two years after its opening, the museum began talks of an expansion. We're constantly and continually growing and to reach our community better. So two years, they have high hopes for expansions. The expansion was to be an 11,000 square foot community center addition, which would include the Raymond James community room, a library, and administration offices. And four years later, the groundbreaking ceremonies were held April 11th, 1988, and the expansion was completed in December 1989.
So I wanted to talk a little bit about community events through the 40 years of our history. The museum serves as an active resource in the cultural life of our community. The following slides are just a few events to highlight this section. And of course, in no way is this a complete um, inventory of our community events. The Fiesta de la Riva. This is, um, some of these pictures were from the first annual Fiesta, which was held in 1983. It was sponsored by the Dolly Museum and the St. Pete Times. And it is a celebration of Dolly's birthday and, and Hispanic culture. Here's some familiar faces. I don't know if you can see. Kathy White, Peter Tush, and we have Mike Gunther in the middle. I don't know if Mike is still here as well. That is one of the amazing things that I love about working at this museum. We have staff who have been here. Joan was here almost 50 years. Kathy White, 40. Peter Tush, 35. Others, 20, 30. Um, just their commitment to this museum and our mission. Another one, this was just four years ago. This is a fun event, Fido plus Frida. It was uh, in conjunction with our special exhibition, Frida Kahlo at the Dali. The museum sponsored a pop-up pet portrait event for the community. And Arts Alive. Arts Alive, or Free Museum Day, is produced by the city of St. Petersburg and participating cultural organizations in conjunction with the National Smithsonian's Free Museum Day. And just recently, we had a wish reading ceremony here as a community event, December 2021. A variety of readers shared simple and heartfelt hopes and wishes from the last decade placed on the beloved wish tree in the museum's Avant Garden. Next section is our junior docent program. In this program, and this has been happening since 1982, so for the full 40 years, we have um, done a junior docent program. Elementary and middle school students are trained in a mini docent course that enables them to share general information about Dolly and his paintings. This program introduces students to artistic processes, builds self-esteem and public speaking skills, and brings families to the museum. These are some pictures from our newsletter. They were originally called the Soapbox Docents. As you can see in the picture on the right, they would stand up on a box. Um, and they were positioned at 16 different paintings, offering explanations of Dolly's work that could be understood from a child's point of view. This is Joy, who is a junior docent who works with us. I found this. I was so excited when I found this photo. So I had to include it. So 2009, and here she is, a staff member in 2022. So our present day junior docent program, this is Allison Cruz's daughter. Um, not only do students learn about Salvador Dali and surrealist art, they are empowered to think independently about art and express their own thoughts. It's just a superb program our way of giving back to the community and the children. I, my two stepchildren went through it twice. They loved it. This is just a wonderful program that our education department manages. And this presentation would not be complete if I didn't mention our volunteers for this museum. The museum depends on a dedicated and talented core of volunteers, docents, interns, and friends to make it the dynamic place it has become. Each year, we honor our volunteers with a reception as a thank you for their service. These two are from the 80s. 
Um, we see Annette Norwood here, who started out as a volunteer, but then quickly became a staff member, and she's still here. It's just incredible. Um, our 350 plus volunteers each year, ranging in age from 14 to 90. Our volunteers are a major force in fulfilling our mission to educate and inspire the public. That's one of my uh, volunteers, June. Sorry, Ira, I didn't have a picture of you. I would have put you in here. Here's a volunteer appreciation from 2018. And we literally could not run this museum without our dedicated volunteers. And we greatly appreciate you. The next topic I'm going to be speaking um, about loans. Throughout the past 40 years, we have had the opportunity to have some of the great Dolly works outside of our wonderful collection on exhibit. Two, we were even able to acquire for the collection. So in 1985 through 86, Gala Contemplating was on loan to us from Martin Lawrence Limited Editions and then sold to a Japanese collector. Here's Mike Gunther on crating, getting ready to prepare to hang this beautiful masterwork. And here it is being hung for the exhibit. But in 2004, Dolly Museum trustee Carlo Bellotti identified its location and initiated its purchase. Lead gifts for its acquisition were made by Tom and Mary James and the Huff Family Foundation followed by other donors from the community in memory of Dolly trustee Jack Painter, who died in 2004. So almost 20 years later after we exhibited, it was purchased, and now it is part of our home. Another one that maybe not everyone realizes that was on loan was Galaxy Dolacy. It was on loan from January 23rd through April 23rd in 1990, in commemoration of the first anniversary of Dolly's death. It was purchased two years later in 1992 and marked the first acquisition of an oil painting to the Dolly Museum since the museum opened in St. Petersburg in 1982. The public unveiling was on March 6, 1992. Now, along with what, this is a technical registrar term, those are incoming loans. Uh, another type of loan that we do is an outgoing loan. So in addition to borrowing works of art, like those you just saw that we later acquired, we are able to share our collection of art to museums around the world through outgoing loans. Just these four are just a sampling of where some of our works have been. We have loaned to Korea, Germany, Monaco, Japan, Brazil, Italy, and to many more museums around the world. And if you're ever wondering where a piece is, if you don't see it in the gallery, check on our website. We have a works on loan page. You can see where these works are traveling. So next I'm going to talk about exhibits. So here at the museum, we have a carefully curated program of special Dolly-inspired exhibitions. And this is where it all started, from 1982. This was the first exhibit in the new building, Homage to Gala. And the slide on the right is a little blurry because it was taken from a very old slide that I had to then digitally scan. Um, but you can see the first exhibit. The next exhibit, the secret life drawings. So 128 drawings from the secret life, Dolly's autobiography, were shown for the first time in North America. This next show, El Pa, was a momentous um, exhibit. It was the first outgoing loan that the museum had done since 1965. 
when Mr. Morris loaned the majority of his collection to the Gallery of Modern, Modern Art. So almost 30 years later, we loaned to El Pa. It set the stage for the museum loaning important works to museums worldwide, which continues today. Director Emeritus Marshall Rousseau, along with Chief Curator Emeritus Joan Croft, played a pivotal role in this shift. In addition, this loan and exhibit allowed the museum to have our basket of bread and Catalan bread conserved at the Dali Foundation in Spain before the exhibit. Now the Young Dali show shown here, and it was a traveling show. It was shown in Spain, England, here. It was the first major exhibition at the museum with loans from the Dali Foundation and the Reina Sofia in Spain. It marked the first time in the museum's 13 year history that there was an exhibition of Dali paintings other than our own. And of course, I don't have time to go through every exhibit through 1999, but this is just a sampling. This is a collection of either gallery guides or catalogs. Um, we have Gaudi, Tatapias, Kenny Scharf, Andy Warhol, four contemporary Spanish artists. And if anyone's ever interested, you can always email the library at thedali.org, and I'd be happy to scan photos and it's something I need to do anyway. Um, so you can see those photos. Now our student surrealist show along with our junior docent program started very early on in the museum and it continues today. The surrealist show, the student surrealist show was initiated in 1985. This annual juried art exhibit presents work by middle and high school students from whom we invite to explore ideas and visions similar to those explored by Salvador Dali and the Surrealists. The earliest photo I could find was from 1996. I'm still in search of maybe the one from 1985. Um, maybe through the years I'll find it. But this is from 1996. And here is from 2013 and we do keep records of every year the three shows the student shows I just didn't have time to show every year and this brings us to the art mobile this is also a program through our education department the art mobile is a themed mobile classroom traveling trailer which draws connections between the artist Salvador Dali in the worlds of math, science, and dreams. Here it is back in 2007. It is a collaborative project of the Pinellas County School Board and the Dali Museum. And here's the Artmobile 2015 to the present Dali on the fly. Yvonne is shaking her head and smiling. Um, this is just the trailer itself is a beautiful piece of artwork. Um, this trailer, this themed classroom, will be seen by over 45,000 students in Pinellas County. And here's a glimpse inside. Um, so they go to elementary school, middle schools, and they learn about Dali and surrealism. And now, the new building. So remember, we here at the, the staff of the museum lovingly called um, old building, new building. That's how we, <laughs> I even have files saved that way. So this building we are in today was first and foremost created to protect the collection from hurricanes. It was designed by renowned architect Jan Weymouth in collaboration with Dali Museum Executive Director Hank Hine and a team that included owner's representative Peter Arendt, civil engineers Wilson Miller Stantic, and construction company The Beck Group. Here's the groundbreaking on December 12, 2008. 
The Dolly Museum staff, the Dolly Museum Board of Directors, and the community work diligently and tirelessly to help surrealize the dream with the groundbreaking ceremony taking place in December of 2008. And I didn't just come up with surrealize the dream, it was the, um, all the pamphlets, the handouts, it was their whole brand at the time. And here's James Martin, the pioneer of bringing the museum to St. Pete, speaking at this momentous occasion, 26 years after the museum's original opening in St. Petersburg. Here's the sign outside of the building, so as people drove by, they could see what was going to, to be in that place, and they could realize the dream. And some of you may recognize some of these photos. We had a display in the overlook and display cases with the 10 year anniversary of the building. Um, but here was a construction photo of October 2009. Here we see the 18 inch thick concrete walls that were poured from a specialty concrete team from Hidalgo, Mexico. and you can start to see where the enigma is gonna be placed. So a year later in January 2010, the building of the enigma, an irregular self-supporting geodesic structure which floods light into all public areas of the museum except the galleries. Now this I did not know about it until I was shuffling and rifling through archival boxes, but there was a ceremony, a countdown ceremony, 365 days to the opening. This just says a lot about the commitment of the staff, our board, our volunteers, docents, the community um, that really worked together to make this building happen. And here it is, January 2011, right before the opening, and we see the finished enigma. Here's the opening parade. The opening parade where volunteers at the museum carried a large loaf of bread from the old site to the new building. If you were able to see um, some of the photos, I had many more from the parade up in the display. People on stilts, people dressed up. Um. So this takes us to exhibits from 2000 to the present. Now remember, from 1995 is when we first started taking in loans outside of our own collection. So, and after the El Paso in 1993 as well. So the exhibition program has grown exponentially now because that has opened us up to borrowing from museums around the world. I can't mention them all, I wanted to, um, but we would have been here for days. So here is a selection. We have Rosenquist. Now these are all the gallery guides, which is something else that you can see on our website. It's all historical ephemera from the archives. Um, but all of these exhibits, Dolly and Mass Culture, Pollock to Pop, um, Spanish Baroque, Dolly by the Decades, Dolly and Film, Dolly and Lamb, The Royal Inheritance, Dolly Works from the Spanish National Collection, um, Santiago El Grande, that's actually when I first started. Um, I remember coming in and seeing that large masterwork on loan. And then um, in 2014, again, we had another Warhol show, and then we had a Picasso and Dolly show. A lot of people are shaking their heads. They remember these momentous exhibits. Escher, Disney and Dali, Ferran Adria, Frida Kahlo, Edward Chida, Dali and Scaparelli, Dali and Duchamp. 
Magritte and Dali, Clyde Butcher, Midnight in Paris. So with having loans and loaning our works out comes a, it's a commitment to share our Dali works with audiences around the world. But that commitment comes with significant responsibility to expertly maintain these precious pieces. So we have a very robust conservation program as well. So here is a conservation visit back in 1997. These rare and distinguished artworks are continually evaluated to determine their preservation needs. In 2011, we did a conservation of the masterworks. This conservation of four of our masterworks all took place in the galleries. Where the general public could watch in real time as works were restored. And also videos were made every day. Bill Wagey um, put these videos on our website and people could get a glimpse into the conservation as it was taking place. Um, a, fascination, a fascinating procedure that not many people get to see. And then in 2016, thanks to the Bank of America Conservation Grant, we were awarded in 2016. We were able to have three additional masterworks conserved. Nature Mort Vivant, Portrait of My Dead Brother, and Velasquez Painting the Infanta Margarita. So this is um, our former conservator, Rustin Levinson, um, working on Nature Mort Vivant. And here she is conserving Girl with Curls. So each year we conserve about two pieces, two oil paintings a year to keep them in the best shape possible so that we are able to show them in the gallery all year long. In research, scholarship, and publication, this is a topic close to my heart because I'm first and foremost a librarian. Research and publication is paramount to the museum. It is always our mission to further educate our community on Salvador Dali and his works. And not many people are aware, but back when the Morrises started collecting, there was really not a lot of art historical writings on Dali. It was more of newspaper clippings and reactions, um, but a. Reynolds and Eleanor Morris became recognized as authorities on Dolly's art, writing numerous books and articles on the artists. This slide here shows works written and published by A. Reynolds Morris up to 1974. There are many more, I just couldn't fit, and we do keep them all in our collection. And this is a slide of exhibition catalogs the museum has published through the years, educating our community of our special exhibits. Um, the majority of the time, we publish our own catalog for each exhibit. Here are two more. That's a little um, preview of the Picasso catalog. It'll be coming out with the exhibit. And here, now these aren't exhibition catalogs. These are other writings. Research efforts on Dolly's artwork continue, and here we see other important publications by the museum, including monographs, conference proceedings, a new and updated version of Dolly's collected writings, a new museum collection book, and a brand new wish tree book. So here at the museum, we are constantly pushing towards more research and um, finding new information about Dali, the Surrealists, and other avant-garde movements, and bringing that information to our public. And maybe not a lot of people know about this, the Avant-Garde Studies online peer-reviewed journal. Since 2015, this is an online publication published by the Dali. It aims to inspire and inform the public about renowned artist Salvador Dali and his work. 
It covers talks and conferences presented by the Dali Museum and published peer-reviewed papers on avant-garde topics, including those about Dali and related ex exhibitions. So I would encourage you on our website to look up the avant-garde studies journal. It's registered with the Library of Congress. People have access to it worldwide. And as the years have gone by, we've created new departments, new programs, along with the Innovation Labs and Women's Empowerment Programs. Innovation Labs at the DALI combines DALI's art, philosophy, and methods with state-of-the-art research on creativity, creative problem solving, and organizational management to offer one-of-a-kind programs that jumpstart creativity and improve innovation outcomes. Here's a couple photos, and you see Kim facilitating those labs. She's done a wonderful job these past few years. And here's a picture of one of our women's empowerment program. And this is a series of workshops specifically designed to work with nonprofit organizations serving women. In digital experiences, we are in the digital age, and here at the Dali Museum, we are dedicated to creating digital experiences that entertain you, inspire you, and encourage your further immersion into all that was and is the genius of Salvador Dali. Dali lives. We see those throughout the museum. It provides museum visitors an opportunity to learn more about Salvador Dali's life from the person who knew him best the artist himself. It really is breathtaking. I Sometimes I don't, I don't get up here often enough to see it or down on the first floor, but sometimes I'll be walking past in the gallery and it, the voice is so similar to recordings of Dali. Another digital experience that we have here is the Dali's Masterworks in Augmented Reality. We view eight Dali Masterworks in the museum's permanent collection using AR technology to gain a deeper understanding of the meaning behind their complex imagery. See the paintings come to life, highlighting and exploring their complexities. Then, of course, we have our Dreams of Dali, virtual reality experience. It is a marriage of art and technology, a virtual reality experience that explores Dali's painting archeological reminiscence of Malay's Angelus. It immerses you into the world of the surrealist master. In wrapping up, for 40 years, the Dali Museum has made its mission to preserve Dali's legacy for let generations to come. We will continue to provide a glimpse into the ordinary, becoming the extraordinary, and make one feel as though a world of infinite possibilities has been revealed. Stay surreal, St. Pete. Thank you.